This is a Dr. T case companion video. In 1936, Fred Christie and his two friends were refused service at the York Tavern in Montreal because Mr. Christie was black. The York Tavern was part of the forum where the Montreal Canadiens hockey team played. Fred Christie had season's tickets and he had been served at the York Tavern in the past. But on this particular evening, when Fred Christie put his money down and asked for a beer, both the waiter and the bartender refused him because they had been instructed not to serve people of color. Fred Christie called the police. The two constables who arrived did not intervene. These are the facts, or at least part of the facts, that gave rise to Christie and York, a case that ultimately went to the Supreme Court of Canada. After Fred Christie was refused service by the York Tavern, Fred Christie's for the humiliation he suffered. At the heart of this case was a seemingly basic question. Does the freedom of commerce allow a business to discriminate? In other words, can a merchant refuse to do business with someone solely on the grounds that the other person is, say, black? In today's world, it may seem ridiculous to suggest that the freedom of commerce allows a business to discriminate. After all, we live in the age of the charter, of rights and freedoms and statutory human rights legislation. So to understand this case, we have to step back in time. We have to go back to Montreal in 1936, before the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, before there was any human rights legislation that prohibited discrimination, before the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When we step back in time and look at this case in time and look at this case more carefully, when we read the decisions of the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada, we see that this case is about much more than the freedom of commerce. We see that this case is very much about race, space, and place. It's a case about who belongs and who doesn't. This is a case about boundaries and who has to know and adhere to boundaries. And this is a case about how law enforces these boundaries in formal and informal ways. So let's go back to 1936. In 1936, the concept of individual rights was not yet fully developed and rights were conceptualized as group entitlements. A person had certain rights because that person was a member of a community that enjoyed those rights. Those rights. To assert and enforce your rights, you had to show that you were a member of a protected community. Thus, the boundaries of community, who is part of us and who is part of them, mattered a great deal. One of the important issues lying just below the surface in Christie and York is whether Fred Christie was a member of a group that should have been protected in these circumstances. Now, neither of the two decisions issued in this case identified this issue explicitly. Instead, when you read the decisions, you find that both Renfret, who wrote the majority decision, and Davis, who wrote a dissenting decision, get entangled in some rather boring parsing of whether or not the York Tavern was an innkeeper and whether or not the selling of beer by York Tavern was a type of monopoly that gave rise to special obligations to the member. Human rights legislation was not yet in existence, and the freedom of commerce meant that a merchant could choose with whom to do business, however arbitrary that decision might appear. The only restrictions under Quebec law at the time related to innkeepers, who had an obligation to provide a meal to any traveler who could pay for that meal, and to those engaged in the provision of goods or services on a monopoly basis. In these types of cases, merchants had an obligation to serve any person who could pay. And so we see Rinfrit and Davis tangle over whether ordering a beer at a tavern amounted to an innkeeper offering a meal to a traveler or the provision of goods on, on a monopoly basis. If you are not looking closely, this case becomes really boring really quickly.
It seems to be all about it seems to be all about interpretations of regulations and innkeepers and whether providing beer is the same thing as providing a meal. Ultimately, Rinfrit, writing for the majority, says nope. Selling beer is not the same as providing a meal to a traveler, and it is not the provision of goods on a monopoly basis. Accordingly, the York Tavern is free to serve whomever it chooses. There is nothing wrong with refusing to serve Fred Christie. Oh, and if he was humiliated, that was his own fault for making such a big deal out of not being served. Davis disagrees. Selling beer is the provision of goods on a monopoly basis. The York Tavern should not have refused Fred Christie. I mean, come on. Fred has season's tickets to Le Canadien. He's a British, British subject. He's part of our city. He is one of us. Now, here's the thing. The dis- if the court wanted to find that Mr. Christie should have been served that beer, The court could have found a way using the law that existed in Quebec at the time. Davis's decision shows us that. And if the court felt that Mr. Christie was not entitled to that beer, it could just as easily wrangle the law to support that position. Runfurt's decision for the majority took that position. So what is driving each of these two decisions? Perhaps the most telling part of the decisions in this case are not the interpretations of Quebec's laws, but rather the way that Rinfret and Davis describe the facts of the case and Fred Christie himself. Let's compare the two decisions. Rinfret depersonalizes Mr. Christie. He never uses Mr. Christie's name. He is only ever referred to as the appellant. We are not told anything, anything about Mr. Christie other than he asked for and then demanded a beer. We are also told that when the York Tavern's employees refused Mr. Christie, they did so quietly, politely, and without causing a scene or commotion whatsoever. As for Mr. Christie's humiliation at being refused, Rinfret states, quote, If any notice was attracted to the appellant on the occasion in question, it arose out of the fact that the appellant persisted in demanding beer after he had been so refused, and went to the length of calling the police, which was entirely unwarranted under the circumstances." End quote. Once you read that paragraph, you get a clear sense of where Rinfret's decision is headed. The York Tavern did nothing wrong, and the appellant brought the humiliation and embarrassment on himself. Davis's decision paints a different picture. Davis begins, by tell- Davis begins by telling us who the appellant Fred Christie is. Pay attention to the things that Davis thought were important to know. Davis tells us that Fred Christie is a British subject, having been born in Jamaica, which is part of our Commonwealth. Fred Christie has been a permanent resident in Montreal for 20 years. He has a respectable job as a private chauffeur. That means he's solidly middle class, employed, and accustomed to navigating his way around Montreal. He has season's hockey tickets, and in fact, he was on his way to a game the night he was denied service. By the way Davis describes Mr. Christie, it's clear that Davis considers Christie to be one of us, an insider, part of our community, someone who should have been served a beer Davis's account of the scene at the York Tavern also differs in an important way from Rinfret's version. Davis says that Fred Christie immediately put out money for the beer. He was willing and able to pay. Christie had enjoyed beers at the York Tavern on previous occasions when he had been at the Forum for hockey games. And on the day of the incident, Fred Christie had stopped by the York Tavern to have a beer with his friends before heading to the hockey game all of which was quite ordinary and normal for Mr. Christie, something he had done in the past. Renfrit's facts show us a picture of an anonymous black figure who demands a beer, who escalates the matter unnecessarily by calling the police, and who embarrassed himself. By contrast, Davis's description of Christie is full of references that suggest that Davis saw Christie as one of us. Christie lives in the city. He works in the city. He is a hockey fan. What could be more Canadian than that? 
And you know what? It is not oh, what? It is not okay to deny a good Canadian chap a glass of beer before a hockey game. Now, if the facts were as simple as they first appear, we could end our study of this case right here. We would learn that before a shift in how human rights were understood as something that individuals enjoyed, the freedom of commerce allowed a merchant to discriminate. We could take note of the fact that Canada does have a history of so-called lawful discrimination and that we have a history of racism in Canada. And maybe we could walk away safe in the knowledge that this type of case probably wouldn't happen today because of human rights legislation and the Charter. But the facts are not as simple as they first appear. And there is a deeper lesson to be learned from this case. You see, the date on which the York Tavern refused to serve Fred Christie a glass of beer was July 11th, 1936. And in 1936, the hockey seasons for the two most prominent hockey teams in Montreal, the Canadiens and the Montreal Maroons, had both ended in March. Fred Christie was not going to a hockey game. There were a number of other sporting events happening in Montreal that evening, and at the Forum, final preparations were being made for the Olympic boxing match, boxing match trials. And boxing was then, as it still is today, a very racialized sport. Now, three weeks before Mr. Christie was denied service at the York Tavern, the first of two historic boxing matches between African-American Joe Lewis and German Max Schmeling had occurred. Lewis was undefeated up to that point, and he was a hero to many African-American, prototypical Aryan-German male, and was a favorite athlete of the Nazi party. Their bouts were framed as a battle for racial supremacy. In that first match between Lewis and Schmeling, Schmeling knocked Lewis out, winning the fight and handing Lewis uh, his first defeat. Riots broke out across various cities in the U.S. Now, meanwhile, people of color had their own hero in Montreal, Raymond Clifford McIntyre, a Canadian Olympic hopeful, a man of color. And at least one Canadian news writer had noted that McIntyre would be fighting uh, on behalf of the black community in Montreal. And so as the Olympic boxing trials drew closer and in anticipation of racially charged matches, the York Tavern refused to, used to serve black people. Now, these were the soft rules of inclusion and exclusion in Montreal at the time. Fred Christie might be a member of the community or not, depending on the context. He could drink beer at the York Tavern when he was there for a hockey game, but not boxing. Christie had crossed an invisible color barrier. He went where he didn't belong. And in this context, the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada had very little difficulty finding that the York Tavern had no obligation to serve Fred Christie a beer, even though he was ready to pay for it, and even though he had been there before. Now, we did not have Jim Crow laws or a formalized legal structure of apartheid in Canada, but racism was and remains a part of our social structures. To move forward, we have to grapple with our past and our present are present. And one of the ways we can do that is by thinking about how race gets mapped out onto space and place. For a man like Fred Christie, borders and boundaries tended to shift depending on context. We have to ask why was it okay for Mr. Christie to have a beer at the York Tavern when he was there for a hockey game, but not when he was there for a boxing match. He hadn't changed, and neither had his money. Mr. Christie drove the streets of Montreal for a living. He had been in the city for two decades. His life was mapped out in Montreal, and yet the city was fickle in when it would embrace him as part of the community. If you are only ever a contingent member of a community, someone who is 
welcomed one day and shunned the next, can you ever feel at home? When you, when you are white like me, you tend not to see the informal boundaries that exist because you never have to do the racial calculus. What is this event? Where is this event? Am I going to be received as a community member or as a potential threat at this event? This is in part what we mean when we talk about privilege. The fact that I do not have to think twice about where I go to say, watch a movie or catch a game at the local bar or where I go out for dinner. Wherever I go, there is a strong likelihood that whatever space I choose will be open to me because I'm white. This means that I don't carry the mental weight of constantly doing this calculus because it is exhausting when you have to keep checking the boundaries and when you experience the shame of being told that today, today, you're not welcome here. It takes a physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual toll, especially when you have to do this calculus day after day after day. Racism persists in Canada, even with the Charter and human rights legislation. It's just that it lies just below the surface. And when you don't have to do the daily calculus of navigating race, space, and place, it's easy to miss. So take a closer look around you. Listen to the stories and the voices of people of color. Learning about the experiences of people of color in Canada is one step forward in our pursuit of justice.